So thank you very much for all of you for being with us today. Thank, uh, I would like to thank Sanjam and Maritime CEO for the second year uh, of hosting uh, 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 me as a panel with me as moderator and uh, with all of you. I will uh, go uh, immediately to present uh, the speakers of this panel, uh, friends and speakers from all over the world. We're here from India, UK, USA, Greece, and Netherlands. And we're having Priscilla Araujo, uh, Operations Manager for the Port of Rio de Janeiro and Cepetiba, Wilson Sands, Brazil. Michael Kokinos, Account Manager, Cell Marine, Texas, USA. Mira Kumar, CBO, Diabos, India and United Arab Emirates. Christos Matikoudis, Area Sales Manager, Varchila Voyage Solutions in Greece. William Speaker, Commercial Manager at Multra Towage and Salvage, Netherlands and Belgium. And Gina Panayotu, CVO of Oceans Arena. My friend Gina is always uh, trying different titles and concept founder of It's All About Shipping in uh, London, UK. So thank you very much. And uh, I would like to welcome all of you. And before starting, uh, to making you the, the questions, uh, asking you uh, uh, specific questions in order to let us know about uh, the title of the panel that it's going to be, it, it is, did you know that every port is a hub of job opportunities itself? I would like from each one of you to present a little bit, what is your daily routine? What your title hides from us and what you're doing every day. So uh, can I start with uh, Priscilla, please? Yes. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Maritime Shio for this opportunity to be here today, talking to you about such relevant topics. As you know, my name is Priscilla Araújo. I'm from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and I have a degree in international relations and an MBA from the Imbemec Institute. I have been working for Wilson Sons for 10 years. And as some of you might know, Wilson Sons is the largest integrated maritime import logistics operator in Brazil and has been operating at national level for over 118 years. I'm currently responsible for the towage division at Rio de Janeiro and Sepetiba ports, where I oversee a fleet of seven tugs and manage a staff of more than 80 onshore and offshore workers, all of which are men. Happy to be here today. Uh, although, although we know that shipping uh, has more men positions than women, we can see that even at this panel, uh, the percentage of the women is bigger than the men. So, so, so sometimes we can change the rules. Uh, I would like to ask from Michael, uh, to present a little bit uh, also himself. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Danae. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Michalis Kokinos, and um, I'm a key account manager with Shell Marine in Houston, Texas. Uh, I support the US Northeast as well as Canadian market. Uh, prior to my role with Shell, I was with Avin International in uh, Athens, Greece. But uh, my main focus day to day is, is supporting vessel owners and, and fleet operators uh, commercially with uh, marine lubricants and fuels. So thank you all. Thank you. And I would like to continue with Mira. Thank you so much, Dane. And apologies to uh, the audience if there are sounds of firecrackers from the background and trying to keep it silent here, but not in my control. Uh, so lovely to meet all of you. My name is Mira Kumar. Uh, I have a shipping professional for over 25 years. I've worked extensively in agency, uh, stevedoring, um, uh, in technology for the last six years. And today uh, I head uh, Diabos, which is a global uh, DA and cost management service company uh, serving the uh, trades uh, for port cost management, uh, cost management, post fixture services, and uh, several digitization services. So, real pleasure to be with all of you. Uh, thank you. Thank you too. Christos? 
Hello, thank you, Denai. Uh, thanks uh, to my time CEO. Uh, thanks to our distinguished panelists and our audience for uh, this opportunity. My name is Christos Matskoudis. I'm an area sales manager at Vats Lavoya Solutions. I lead a team of sales managers and coordinators for supporting the Eastern Mediterranean region. What we do at Vats Lavoya is that we leverage the latest uh, digital technologies in order to support what we call smart marine ecosystem. This is a, a vision which entails the trendy topics, as you know, of uh, digitization, decarbonization, optimization, automation. I joined the shipping industry uh, a few time ago, a few, uh, some time ago, uh, by representing two big weather companies. But prior to shipping, I worked at technology firms um, uh, and uh, served the various industries such as retail, wholesale, pharmaceuticals, and try later to communicate these best practices that I acquired from these uh, industries to more traditional industry as shipping. I studied, men, uh, I studied mechanical engineering at the National Technical University of Athens and obtained an MBA from the Athens University of Economics. Great, thank you very much. And Willem? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Willem Spanker. I work at uh, Multership Toads and Selberts in the Netherlands. Uh, which is uh, jointly owned by uh, the Muller family and uh, Fairplay Towards from Hamburg. Uh, within the group, we operate uh, towards services from uh, in the range from Antwerp to Poland. Uh, my main focus area is uh, harbor towards, but within our group, we also have a strong focus on sea towards and salvage. And uh, besides uh, my customer relations with uh, Harbor Towards clients. Uh, my main focus is also on uh, decarb decarbonization of our fleet, uh, which brings a lot of uh, nice challenges. Um, so it keeps me busy. Thank you. Great. And Gina? Thanks, Anai, for the invite today. It's such a pleasure to be at the second Maritime Shio conference. And of course, be moderated by you. Your panels are always great and empowering the youth. Um, I'm Gina Panayotu. I'm a strategist and maritime lawyer with an MBA. Uh, I've worked mainly for the past almost eight years in-house, ship owning companies from commercial shipping to cruise liners. And for the past year, I've set up my own consultancy practice, Oceans Arena. CVO is actual, actually a C, uh, chief visionary officer, and it's a stolen title from uh, Simon Sinek. And basically what we do, we help um, startups in the ocean sustainability era, um, do the brand and legal strategies in a more approachable and bespoke way. So that's a few things about me. Great. And uh, we will start, I'm the Nebuzandarko, I did not say a lot about myself. I am also CEO of Navigator Shipping Consultants, a robust network of ship agencies and towing companies from all over the world. We're also cooperating with uh, Diabos in, in Greece. We're organizing Navigator, the Shipping Decision Makers Forum. And I'm also concept founder of Yes Forum of the Young Executive Shipping Forum, the platform that connects the young people with the shipping community. And uh, I will go immediately to the, to the questions of uh, today. And I will start with uh, Michael. Uh, the energy, oil gas, oil and gas sector are at the center of climate change. And you know that everybody discusses about climate change uh, these days because of COP26. I know that this is a title of an entire forum and not only of a question, of course, uh, but can you share with us what a young person that joins shipping today should know? Of course, uh, and this is a great uh, question or to a topic in itself of what a, a young professional should be doing uh, within this new frontier. Um, you know, we at Shell are really focused in setting a course of decarbonizing shipping in itself, as of many other companies. But Shell has really taken the responsibility to um, to to move forward and try to be the most innovative. Um, innovative partner in the industry. But um, one thing I'd, I'd like to point out that we at Shell have definitely identified as many as other players within the industry, as if there's no real silver bullet to how we're going to uh, attack this complex challenge of uh, net zero by, by, by 2050. And so uh, with that said, there's, there will most likely be many solutions to, to uh, achieving this goal. And in addition, across all subsectors of shipping in itself. So uh, 
in addition to shipping, there's going to be as well as the industrial sector, as well as transport sectors that will likely influence, influence the outcome, outcome for shipping in itself. So um, one thing we've noticed in itself is that 90% of correspondents within sh the shipping industry have uh, made decarbonization a, a complete priority. So with that said, as a young professional, I think it's really important to, to maintain a learner mindset within, within your approach to your career and, 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 and making a difference or making your own difference within, uh, within the industry. So coupled with the learner's mindset, I think uh, it's good to take the approach to think big as well as um, once you think big and you can identify the problems, you start small and then from there, scale fast. So yeah, that's, that's on a professional level. Now here at Shell regarding decarbonization, what we're doing is uh, developing future technologies. And uh, so that's, for example, working with Kawasaki Heavy, Heavy Industries regarding our, uh, our first hydrogen vessel, hydrogen containment vessel. Uh, in addition, uh, reducing emissions through efficiency. So not only through softwares like JAWS, which is a draft software we've, de we've developed, um, and our strategic partners, as well as operational and technical support. On the trading front, biofuels and LNG, as you all have seen, uh, Shell has made major investments in LNG. And um, from there, a really nice topic to talk about nowadays is uh, balancing emissions through carbon credits. I'd like to point out one of our customers, GasLog, who has, who were the first to offset uh, their carbon emissions by purchasing marine lubricants uh, through Shell. So um, with all that highlighted, if you don't mind, Danae, I'll move into question two, if that's okay. And first, uh, we go to the, the question number two, which is yeah. which has to do about the spectrum of job opportunities that the energy and fuel sectors offer today for a young person. What qualifications should they have? Because every time we speak with young people, I think you in, in the countries that you represent and here in Greece, uh, we do it. Most of the young people now, one of the main questions is what qualifications I must have in order to enter this complicated world of physics. <laughs> this, is, this is true. And I'd like to start this off. I think willingness and um, willingness to learn and to work hard are two major qualifications that are above all. That's one thing. Um, on the ed educational front, I like to, I have a maritime degree from the Maritime Academy here in, uh, in Texas, as well as a master's from there. And um, I am now working towards another MBA from Rice University. So as you can see on the educational front, I'm a I'm big promoter, but I always go back to my maritime um, background. Though um, one other thing I would like to highlight in referencing back to, to what we talked on in question ones, it, this is going to be as the maritime industry or the shipping industry itself is now going to become more of an e e ecosystem approach to just energy in itself. So with, with that said, we're going to see a lot more interdependence from other sectors like transport fuels, as well as the in infrastructure developers. So like I said, with this uh, ecosystem approach, there lies many opportunities uh, to, to, to find your niche as, as, as a young professional. And um, it goes from the banking sector to the operationals, commercial sector, even, uh, you know, we work closely with oceanographers when it comes to uh, research for the uh, materials to make batteries for fuel cells and battery cells. So, like I said, this, this is a, a really interesting time and in, in a, in a good opportunity for us as young professionals in itself to treat this as a, um, as a new frontier and, and be pioneers in the industry in itself. So. Of course, and that shipping did not stop even for a day. So it's a great exactly. uh, prospect uh, for the young people um, that at yeah. least they know that even a pandemic did not stop, uh, did not manage to stop uh, uh, shipping going around. And, uh, I, I take the good opportunity to go to the technology lady 
uh, of the panel. Of course, we're all uh, into technology now, but uh, uh, to me, and I would like to ask uh, the young generation, of course, and new technologies. Okay, it's it's also the the new kid on the block. Uh, young executives will be the one, uh, the ones who will implement the new technologies and platforms in shipping. According to your opinion, is shipping and young executives prepared for this transformation? Will the transformation change the way you view our beloved maritime industry? And before you reply to the question, I, I would like to thank Michael. He has to, uh, to leave the panel because he has an urgent meeting to, to attend. And we know that with the new hybrid life, uh, we have to be online and in meetings at <laughs> the same time. But we would like to thank you very much for being with us. And uh, of course, we will stay in contact because oil will not disappear. Uh, is it right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay, great. And thank you, Michael. Thank you, Danae. And, and, and you have a please, anyone reach out to me. I always like to end with that. Uh, Danae has all my information, and uh, I love talking about this stuff. Of course. Okay. Of course. Great. Thank you very much. So, thank you. Mira. Thank you. What's going yep. on with this uh, with this question? How can you reply to this? It's a huge, it, it's not an easy question, but I think that you can manage it. Because sure, you have sure, to do with many young people. Happy to. And I must first say thank you for asking the technology question second, because, you know, in most seminars, you finish with everything and right the last session would be technology, because sadly in the industry still, uh, in the order of precedence, we still seem to put it second to last or just at the last. So thank you for changing the order of things here. Um, it, it's a really interesting question and one which I um, actually spent time thinking about, uh, Dene. Uh, most of us in this uh, panel have been uh, many years uh, in the industry. Um, and um, I, I think technology is what has kept us young and what has kept us relevant. Um, and, and therefore, we will lot to thank technology for. Your question was specific to, uh, are the young people prepared for the adoption of new technologies? That was the first part of your question. I think they're more than prepared. I think they're born uh, expecting a minimum level of technology to be in every facet of their life. Uh, I think they come into companies, um, you know, interviewing us, if you will, as to uh, how technology can help them do their job. And many of us old timers um, resent it at times uh, because we feel that, uh, you know, if you can't rely on your own wit or, your, or, or more traditional methods, uh, what are you going to do when technology fails? But that may not be the best way to see it because this is uh, still uh, the early days of technology in maritime. So it's things are going to get far more exciting from here. So I think they are correct to come in and interview companies to see their mindset on technology. So uh, the answer to the first question is, I think they're more than prepared. Do they, does being prepared mean knowing how to use technology? Not necessarily. Leaning back on what Michael said earlier, which I completely agree with, it's more the learning mindset. If you want technology and technology by nature, makes it always easy to use a good technology is, is is you know dummy proof so it makes itself easily understood and easily adapted so i definitely think that the new generation is already well equipped uh, will it change the way they see our industry i i think the answer is a resounding yes and i'm really happy about that because uh, 25 years ago when i was introduced to a maritime i fell in love uh, with the industry and i still am there uh, and I think uh, in the recent past, it's been difficult to get good young people here uh, because of this mismatch of expectations. So I think uh, having uh, technology infused in every aspect of our maritime industry is going to make this a very exciting place for young people again. And interestingly, it's going to be statisticians, it's going to be tech experts, it's going to be uh, you know trend mappers, and it's going to be traditional operational experts that will be the mix, as I see it, of the new shipping. I hope that answered, Dene. No, you, you answered very well. And I will, I will just add that it's also, uh, you know, there is um, technology sometimes does not have the long-term commitment. I mean, uh, 
technology is changing every day. So the commitment is not the same to a specific project. On the contrary, in, in shipping, you must be long-term committed uh, on, uh, and, and in love with this sector. So what I think that we must work a little bit more to the young people that will enter shipping and technology into shipping is this long-term commitment to the sector because it will not be easy to change sectors and uh, uh, into shipping. And uh, I, I will take this opportunity to, uh, to uh, give the microphone, to pass the microphone to, to Priscilla. Uh, because um, she's also working for a company that uh, is, is a towing company, but uh, is very much technologically oriented. Uh, although they are also giving a lot of attention to the human uh, element because it's, it's very important. And um, uh, you also have the, uh, the great, uh, let's say, advantage of being a woman <laughs> in shipping, uh, which is, uh, which is, and you're performing extremely good. I mean, your position is very high and uh, in a company that we said that uh, is, is also very innovative. So what you would suggest a young lady entering today a shipping company and what was that motivated you to succeed and not to stop, although there were no female uh, operations uh, manager in the company? Well, uh, thanks for the performance, extremely well compliment. <laughs> I truly hope that it came from my boss. <laughs> uh, I have to say that I was not probably the first woman. I was the first in my company in operations management, and I'm very proud to pave the way for many to follow, and I'm sure they will. Shipping is, in fact, a broadly male environment, but it has been changing a lot nowadays and with more and more women coming to the sector. However, few of them are in or ever reach a leadership role. So what advice can I give for women who want to get into shipping? I would suggest not to be intimidated by this male environment. They must act as equals, show their abilities and pursue their goals. Shipping is captivating, as you told. And the natural ability of women to multitask is a perfect fit for this area. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And now, uh, yes. for the second part of your question, what motivated me? Well, I, I have always been driven by challenges. And although succeeding in getting a leading role as a woman was indeed a challenge, it was easier because I love what I do and reaching my professional objectives as a person may have been more important to me than the fact that I'm a woman. But the truth is we need to change the scenario, the scenario of not seeing women in leading roles in shipping. The motivation should be the job, not the gender. In summary, that's what I believe the night. Exactly, when you, are lo when you love what you're doing, there is no gender into this. You just love what you're doing. And this is what I also replied in a panel that I was invited yesterday for a new incubator for entrepreneurship in Greece, when they asked me, uh, what's going on with the young entrepreneurship, the youth entrepreneurship, or the women entrepreneurship? And I said that entrepreneurship does not have a gender. So I say this to you. Uh, it, it has to do with the capable entrepreneurs and the non-capable entrepreneurs. So the same I would say for the people in city. But if you love what you're doing, there is no gender and uh, everybody respects you. And we will go now to the, to the, to the man of the towing, uh, of the towing world because uh, uh, you are also having a great career and the company, Multraship Towage and Salvage is a towing company with a long history in shipping service, some of the busiest, in some of the busiest ports uh, of Europe. Could you explain how important are towing services for vessels operations and what the future holds? Uh, yes, um, I think um, basically towage is safety. Eh? We, we assist uh, vessels with escorting and mooring and unmooring. 
and we also assist vessels uh, at sea that are in distress, for instance, with uh, engine troubles uh, or some or whatever can go wrong. So, so I think it is inherently to do with safety and to say what the future holds, nobody knows, of course. Eh? But I think the near future holds that we are all looking for uh, alternative fuels to cut, to cut our emissions. Um, the midterm future, I think we are looking at uh, uh, remote controlled operations, especially for, uh, for mobilization stretches. Um, and in the long in the long future, it might be uh, autonomous uh, sailing or uh, even uh, swarms of smaller tugs that are deployed by software systems or uh, or whatever you can imagine. Uh, I think that's the beauty of our uh, of our profession is that uh, we we can dream and we can only uh, work towards towards that dream in in many aspects. Of course, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very important also in the skills in all what we say is great to have the technology, but sometimes even the human element and the reaction to the emergencies because every day is different in shipping. So I think that if the computers manage to arrange everything in shipping, then we can all stop working worldwide. So it's, it's not easy because there is so many new cases every day. and. Uh, uh, this is what I would like to ask uh, Christos, because we, uh, we are, you, you also mentioned many times that we speak because we have been in a, a few panels together about the smart shipping and technologies. Of course, this okay. is uh, what Varchila is also doing and uh, you have to, uh, you know, to promote what you're doing. But uh, when, uh, uh, what should the young people have in mind when they're listening to these terms and uh, how is connected to ports? Uh, what are the new job opportunities, professions, collaborations that a young person can change, can change in order to work for uh, shipping from your point of view? Okay, that's a, that's a really great question. I would say about the young person, what we have in mind, nothing that she or he doesn't know already. It's about digitization. The world is moving towards this direction. The shipping industry too is transforming to digital. So now we're talking about terms like connectivity, super high efficiency, greater safety, enhanced environmental performance. Actually at Varsila, our products like Smart Move, Smart Dock, Smart Envy can give actually a hint on where we're heading. And we serve this agenda by harnessing the capabilities of the technologies um, and concepts like artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, um, cloud, big data, Internet of Things, in order to create a, a superior digitally connected ecosystem, as said before. So as we speak at Vatsla, we have connected 11,000 vessels and 300 ports global. Now in a circular economy like shipping, it is important that decisions need to be what we call timely. And today, shipping companies and ports, they have the crucial problem of quality data collection, but that's not enough. They need to be able to translate fast the data into reliable and actionable information. So they can do that only by acquiring know-how of all these information uh, technologies. So a lot of new specialties, to answer the second question, which have been emerged in order to support analyze, utilize, evaluate technology and products, like, uh, for example, IT specialists, data and business analysts, various consultants, support roles can be occupied um, in modern shipping. And of course, there's also, you know, the old time classic sales profession. I have to tell that as a salesperson, <laughs> because someone needs to move the industry with uh, smart business proposals. And this is, this is, uh, this is also, very, very good to, to hear all the aspects, what I mean, of uh, what's going on. Gina, you, you, are, you have to do with uh, many young people all these years. You are very young also, but uh, you are, <laughs> you are uh, doing many panels and moderating and speaking into panels. Together we have been in many panels. And also when we, uh, we did the first uh, Global Young Shipping Forum with Yes Forum, gathering young people from all over the world, and uh, uh, many, uh, uh, the reason that we are 
also doing many panels with uh, many young people from all over the world is that shipping is worldwide. I mean, shipping is not only, it's a worldwide job. It's not only, it's a not a local job. It's an international job. So many uh, uh, people, young and older, they are uh, thinking during uh, their lives to change country, to go to another country to work, maybe for better money, for better life. Uh, are there specific links that can help in the process of finding a job uh, in, another, uh, uh, in another country? And uh, at which point would you suggest a young person to work abroad at a junior or at a senior level? I think you're very correct in saying, I mean, shipping can really take you anywhere because it's such a global industry. Um, now there's there is huge opportunities i mean and there's different ways to go about it obviously there's not a one size fits all uh, what i would say when it comes to relocation like the main difficulty is like understanding and knowing your why why are you doing it because it's a move beyond your comfort zone so it does have its own hard hardship so it's really all about the mindset and whether you're looking at it as a new exciting journey with what it has to offer or if um, and what the reason you're doing it for essentially each has a personal reason and goal. Um, when it comes to specific linking and networking yourself in the new place that you're looking to relocate, I think it's very helpful to try and reach out to maybe communities or people that can connect you to somebody locally there just to get a better understanding. That's probably a more realistic perspective. And also don't be as afraid to, you know, reach out on LinkedIn to people that you think might be a good connection at a particular company you, you're considering, which is always very helpful. And then, of course, there's also very niche maritime uh, recruiters who are global and can place you practically anywhere, depending on what you want. But just to make sure that you're on the right track, it's always good to get an understanding from a local. Um, now to answer whether junior or senior, uh, I think, again, it comes down to your why. It's not a one, so it, it, there's not a correct answer to it. What I would say, if you're, if you're moving at a more junior level or staying on a, to, in a foreign country after your studies, it's probably more easily to adjust and build your circle and adapt to the culture. Uh, but on the other hand, what I see, having talked to people who come on in junior roles, is that they have this nostalgic, perfect um, <laughs> picture of how it's back home, and they've always got it at the back of their mind, and there's regrets, so it kind of sets you back. So maybe when you relocate at a more senior level, as I did, even though I'll take your compliment of being young, <laughs> but I did relocate like 10 years after working in Cyprus, um, you're more mature and more aware of what, why you're doing this and what you want and possibly have a better understanding on, you know, finding that job that really suits you. So, yes, and you may not still find it all over the world if you don't really want it. But yes. the very important thing is that when you are taking a decision in anything you want in your life, just to take, um, just to be part of the consequences. I mean, not exactly. to try to blame somebody uh, of your decisions because they were your decisions and they must be your decisions. So this is this is very important. And uh, of course, it's up of why you do it. I mean, if you if you are older and you want to have a family, you will maybe stick in that country. If you're young and you want experiences, it's not going to be easy because you don't have the experience <laughs> to handle the new experiences. So yes, I, I fully agree with you. Mira, there are some, uh, now that we're saying about the consequences and when you're saying something, uh, we are hearing uh, many times stereotypes. Uh, from, I mean, uh, one of the stereotypes that we're hearing very often lately is that the technology will replace the humans. Uh, the human people, I mean, uh, the, the, the people. And uh, uh, many people, you know very well that we're hearing, ah, if you use a platform, it may replace my, uh, my job. So uh, you are uh, working in Diapos that you cooperate with many operators, owners, brokers, and uh, I don't believe because we're also cooperating together that uh, anybody has been replaced. Uh, by divers, but they have given they have given a better life, uh, business life. 
how can you explain from your point of view, because you're speaking with many people all over the world, uh, um, how platforms help the operation and commercial departments, because of your case, it's the operations and commercial departments in normal times uh, stakeholders without having an intention uh, to replace them. Uh, uh, and uh, what are the reactions from all the kind of uh, ages and maybe a little bit for more from the young people? Do you believe that they, there is still a fear that the technology may replace them? Thanks, Jenny. That's a big question and I guess a slightly controversial one, um, but I love those kinds. So thank you. Um, I think uh, it, the, the, the statement comes from a very natural fear of change um, and technology is revolu revolutionizing our industry uh, and many others before uh, maritime. And it comes from a space of not understanding. Uh, because end of day, as I see it, uh, many people use the same words before me, many of the speakers, we use the word ecosystem, we use the word knowledge sharing, we use the word facilitating better decisions. So for all of this, if you notice, an ecosystem connects various people end of day and companies, it doesn't replace them. Uh, knowledge sharing connotes that it has to be shared between, you know, point A to point B, not replace it. And even, uh, you know, terms like uh, Chris used earlier on artificial intelligence and machine learning and all of this, uh, all of these are designed to aid, um, aid the human being as, as I see it. Uh, the only areas that will perhaps, um, uh, you know, for naturally uh, dissolve will be those areas where we are repeating or, or doing non-intelligent uh, work or uh, duplicating or leading to error due to multiple handling, those are the little few things that will sort of naturally, uh, you know, evolve um, and dissolve. Uh, but I do think that, uh, for example, in DevOps, we deal with over 8,000 agents globally. Uh, we deal with uh, many, many times that in terms of other port vendors. Uh, there was a feeling maybe 20 years ago when such business started that multiple parties, competitors could not be on the same platform. And today, 20 years later, more and more people are looking at getting on the same platform. Those initial fears of, oh, uh, you know, what if my competitor knows about me or, oh, uh, well, then it, will it be easier for them to find my client or, oh, uh, is it all going to become about price? 20 years later, we realized it was unfounded because people found ways to distinguish uh, their own business value and uh, business actually flourished. It became easier to go global uh, without having to, uh, you know, set up entire offices and, and then slowly make inroads. Digitization allowed companies to move uh, shores very easily. So I do think, Dane, uh, briefly, that uh, the ecosystem is, is such a beautiful word because it basically, I think, has a huge human element to it. Uh, it connects us, it feeds us, it nurtures us, it gives us more transparency, and it helps everybody get an equal chance at growth. It actually eliminates a lot of the uh, you know, differences between very large and very small companies. Uh, both get a sort of an even chance at uh, proving their value, proving their growth, and it increases visibility into even small markets. You wanted to move to a part of the world you've never lived in or never, you know, moved to or shipped with or done business with before. If you have a platform you trust, you do this, you know, with very little uh, need for your own due diligence and your own risk uh, mitigation. So it's, it, I think that um, it's, it's very unfounded, uh, these fears. And I think in terms of young people, honestly, uh, have less of these fears. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's the middle and senior level people who still uh, tend to worry uh, as to what technology might or might not do uh, to them. But I think, in my personal opinion, it's unfounded. Um, and as long as one chooses the right partners, it can be transformational. Exactly, the teamwork. 
I would ask uh, Priscilla about the pandemic and the challenges that they're facing, but she's facing a challenge about an emergency into the port. So she, she, has, she has to go and uh, uh, this is shipping. So Priscilla will not ask you about the challenges, but we will have you in one of the next panels in order to tell us if you manage to, <laughs> to face the challenge. So Priscilla, it was very nice having you. Uh, from Brazil, and uh, we wish you all the all the best in this uh, emergency. And uh, le let's hope that uh, we're sure that you will manage to face it. <laughs> so yeah, the sure. best. Thank you. Thanks again. Thanks again for the invite, and I hope to see you soon. Of course. Okay. Till next time. Thank you. Thank you, Priscilla. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Bye bye. So uh, I would uh, like now to go to William and uh, ask. Um, how did you decide to work uh, uh, in this part of uh, the shipping sector? What are the main qualifications somebody should have in order to join a, com a commercial department? Um, Except not being afraid that the technology will replace them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was born near the sea here in the, in the Netherlands. So shipping uh, had my attention from a very young age. And after I went to a school in Rotterdam, um, I came back here to uh, the southwestern part of, of the Netherlands to join a shipping agent, where I worked for about 13 years before I, uh, I wanted to broaden my horizon to, uh, to other parts of shipping. And I think uh, shipping agencies have a very good, uh, how do you call it, uh, a base, it gives you a very good base knowledge of all the parties that are involved. So I could, uh, I could really make a choice uh, in which parts I would go for, want to go further. And then, uh, well, in our area, Multorship is uh, a very well-known uh, company uh, with a good, uh, which is a good place to work. Um, uh, well, uh, what do you need to work at the commercial department? Um, I think you need a good knowledge about, uh, about the business. Uh, about your own business, but also the business of your uh, of your counterparts. And personally, uh, you need to be interested in other persons and uh, and other companies uh, to have a, a deep understanding of their needs and and how you can help. And uh, and then from there you can uh, you can build an equally beneficial relationship. And I think that's the uh, that's the most important thing that you need to do. And also have the ability to, to uh, how can I say, to get uh, closer to many different cultures from all over the world, because uh, uh, because we cooperate many years our companies. Uh, I can say that uh, okay, you have to do with um, mainly the Greek mentality from us, but there are also some foreign companies in Greece. Uh, but it's not, it's not easy because every country has different mentality. So yep. it's not a specific way of selling into no, a no. shipping commercial department. Yeah, yeah I, that's uh, for me. It's kind of natural uh, because because that's what we do all day. But it, indeed, it's very important to uh, to adapt to uh, to your counterparts. Eh? That uh, talking to and, somebody and from course, from Greece or something I, else. And, yeah. As we say in shipping, we never know everything. And no. Nobody is perfect <laughs> except the captain. <laughs> So, uh, Christo, can you please describe us also, because it's also important, yes, not to make the promotion of our companies, but to say what we're uh, doing. And we, this is why I'm also asking some info on the, on the companies. Uh, what Naviport project of Varsila uh, Voyage is and how many parties are involved in it and in which way are these parties benefiting? Because it's also a project that may benefit many new jobs. Uh, yeah, in, uh, in the world. Jobs and stakeholders, I would say, um, the night the industry is moving to just in time arrival. So there are a lot of ongoing projects at the moment and initiatives already from the European Union, the IMO and Global Industry Alliance, PIMCO, Ship Traffic Management, International Task Force for Port Call Optimization. Naviport is Varsla Voyages awarded just in time arrival solution for the ports. And in other calls, we're talking about this digital port call solution. It is already used in some of the busiest uh, ports in the world, uh, Singapore, Antwerp, uh, Hamburg, Valencia, and Tajir Med, which was also the first uh, digital port call ever with uh, um, a HAPAC uh, Lloyd uh, container vessel. 
In essence, it is a real time communication regarding time of arrival between the vessel and the port or the terminal. And we're talking about required and estimated time of arrival. And that helps the vessel to regulate the speed and optimize the voyage. It helps the port to avoid congestion and to manage more efficiently its booking system. And also it helps the port and the towing agencies to plan the daily operations with more confidence and efficiency and less surprises. Um, in general, we had a just-in-time case study in the port of Rotterdam, uh, which showed that uh, on average, a waiting day can be saved with just-in-time solutions. So all these uh, lead to the real benefits of just-in-time arrival. It's the decarbonization and the cost benefits. So uh, you have to consider that the maritime industry is calculated of losing some billions of dollars each year because the port calls are not coordinated transparently or not on time. Congestion is the port's enemy, as we say. So with Navbot now, coordination is much easier. The vessel's anchor time is reduced. The emissions of both voyage and port are reduced. Noise pollution is reduced. The ports are not forced now uh, to spend for necessary infrastructure in order you know, to solve these congestion-related problems. Overall safety is increased by removing traffic, fuel saving and enormous. So you understand that it's no brainer that all the industry is moving towards that direction. So you believe that the next, uh, I will not say three months because it's very short period, but uh, the next six months, uh, because the pandemic, we see that uh, we're having a new rising numbers in many countries, at least in Europe with COVID. Do you believe that uh, these technologies uh, may help uh, uh, slowly, slowly the ports of not having congestions and uh, this? Um, so of course. Uh, of course, of course, it's very, it's very important, and uh, you know. But mainly, it's also the benefits are in the voyage. Um, the vessels are, are saving, you know, much fuel. They optimize their voyage. Um, uh, there's not because you know the industry is getting to you know, the super slow steaming, and that is very important that all these vessels come, you know, in the right slots at the ports. But always very important to filter which people will uh, promote these platforms and will uh, uh, make these technologies happen in uh, shipping because, uh, you know, shipping, as, I, as we said before, it was the only sector that did not stop due to the pandemic. And it's, it is attracting lately many funds and uh, newcomers and golden boys and girls, as I, as, as I mentioned them, without understanding that it's not just uh, it's not a sector just to, uh, you know, to earn money or to create platforms, but uh, a sector that runs the 90% of the worldwide uh, trading. And I will finish um, uh, this panel with the question to Gina because she's, uh, she's always uh, speaking about the young talent. And um, so you, will re you have replied it again. I don't know, sometimes I, I, I have to... Uh, you know, to gather all these uh, questions to you about talent and to see every three, four years what you are replying and if this is changing. But uh, I think that more or less uh, it's the same. How young talent contributes to shipping and uh, strategy to fill gaps, how to attract talent to shipping? Uh, I tell you, I will do again, once again, this question to you, but I think that uh, we need to hear it even if it remains the same or changes a little bit. So what you will say to us this year, it has changed it or it remains the same? I think the main kind of umbrella is always consistent. So uh, the young talent and talent in general is the future, full stop. Um, but I'm very happy that you answer that you you repeat this question because it will come down to what I will discuss about the strategy in a, in a second. Um, I will separate it in two kind of phases when it comes to young talent and how it contributes to shipping. So if we take, for example, climate action, one of the main drivers and the emphasis that is given is because of the social voices out there putting so much pressure on stakeholders and government heads. So that's quite important. So basically the future and the debate on the future has gone public and nobody does public better than Gen, um, Gen Z and millennials. I mean, they share what they eat for breakfast, they share everything that comes to the mind within a split second. 
Um, then secondly, the, one of the IMO themes is how digitalization is driving the future of shipping. So with these two combined, and as the industry, the world has moved forward, COVID has proved how we have had to adjust to virtual world. And uh, as the world is moving forward, so is the shipping industry. So it needs to compete and it cannot compete if it does not have this younger generation on board who have a different kind of more purpose-driven approach. Uh, other things are more important to them. Uh, they adapt very quickly, as we have seen with COVID, they were the first kind of generation that were easily to adapt to working from home. They bring new ideas, they have a more reactive uh, approach. Social media is all about reaction and quick reaction, so that's quite important. Um, and now coming back to what you said and why I'm happy that you asked this question, I think in filling the gaps, and you know that I'm a very passionate brand ambassador of the industry, as you are also, you are my inspiration, in fact, um, we need to brand this industry better. I mean, that's another full stop and non-negotiable for me. We're not doing a very good job. We need to be putting it out there more. I mean, it's so it really makes the world go around. It didn't stop for a minute during COVID. And a lot of people don't know it. So things like what you do and taking uh, students to shipyards to see what it's all about and just fast, captivating them basically on what shipping does. Secondly, I think we also really need to try and cater our mindset a little bit to their needs because shipping has a more traditional kind of mindset. So we need to somehow make it more sellable. Maybe the salesperson here can give us some tips on how we can do that. Um, and it needs to grow towards a purpose that people will feel proud to be a part of. So in that respect, making it more attractive. And I'll also, on a final note, uh, touch on what Mira said about technology. It's all about technology now. Uh, that's definitely changing the scene. So it's helping us to bring this new talent and attract it with new roles. But we also need to find ways of being truly inclusive and diverse and engaging them because that's what they need to feel that they are truly contributing, that they're making a difference. So it's very important for traditional shipping organizations to be much more open-minded and make sure that they are inclusive when it comes to bringing young talent on board. Of course. And uh, before closing this panel, are you positive for the future? Because the last uh, two years, I think have been very, difficult and different and challenging for all of us. So, Christo, yeah. are you positive for the future? Of course. Of course, yeah. always positive. We're Great. looking forward, Danai. We're looking forward. There is no, what's going no, on. no other way. Yeah, and I think that uh, we had our, um, you know, the system actually was um, stressed a lot and uh, you know tested a lot and now i think that we can uh, see some light at the end of the tunnel you know the tunnel. i think you always have to be positive it's uh, <laughs> there there are a lot of challenges ahead of course but uh, but but you have to to think that they are nice challenges and we have so many things to uh, to make better and uh, like the other speakers also told uh, a lot of young people are uh, are there in the world and we can uh, i think we can give them a great workplace and so we are going to move forward and uh, yeah and, and just and make, it, make it make it a better place so it's uh, yeah i think although, it's... although although the word positive is not so positive anymore because when somebody says i'm positive <laughs> everybody is afraid it is positive yeah. in covid uh, gina are you positive for the future <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's so true with the word positive uh, but yes for the future of shipping I'm very positive I think it's one of the most exciting times actually to be in the industry but I also think that COVID as challenging as as frustrating and distressing as it was it definitely taught us to be more creative and more collaborative so definitely a bright future ahead great Mira Absolutely, Dene. I think uh, we all, all of us here feel a bit like survivors, you know. Uh, there's been so many ups and downs and here we are. So I think, and, and there's no industry that better demonstrates uh, resilience than shipping and logistics. So even with the vaccines, right? So I, I'm extremely positive about the industry as a whole. Great. 
for sure. So with this with this positive, uh, uh, you know, note, note uh, I would like to thank you all. Uh, you know, the new hybrid life affected our panel. So two of the speakers get to to go to emergencies uh, uh, during uh, during their speech. This is the new positive <laughs> hybrid life. I would like to thank. Uh, Chris, uh, Willem, uh, Gina, Mira, and of course Priscilla and uh, Michael uh, for uh, uh, participating in this panel. We we get to manage India, UK, USA, Greece, Netherlands, and Brazil to be the same time at the same time panel, and we finally made it. So thank you all very very much, and uh, hope to meet again soon. And uh, let's be positive to meet uh, face to face and hug and kiss each other. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Nana. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So I think that we are uh, that we are okay. I also stopped recording. Sajam, we had new hybrid uh, speakers that yeah. they had to go somewhere else. <laughs> oh, this is great. Thank you so much, Danai. As usual, uh, you, you, you've you been such a wonderful support, a wonderful friend. And thank you to all the speakers who joined us today. Um, we thank you for organizing it for second year and uh, for doing everything and the least we can do is to support each other. So I was very happy to be among uh, uh, friends and colleagues because we, most of us, we cooperate in several projects, profit and non-profit. So it was nice that we met uh, with, uh, the, you know, with Maritime CEO because this is what I also believe that it's good to be together not only in business, but also in the panels. So I'm, I'm happy that Willem, uh, Mira is okay, he's already participating, Chris and Gina. Willem was his first time and uh, Priscilla in, uh, in a panel like this. So we'll, I hope that you that you enjoyed. <laughs> Fabulous, and but we are definitely, Mira, don't you agree with me? We need to have Eddie and everybody down here to Mumbai next oh, year. Of course. We, course. We, and we we'd would. love for you to be here. We'd love to host you all. First, you will come in Posidonia in June. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I will not say no for that. Phantom, you should, you and I shall travel together there. So first we will all be in I, I, I think Amira and William must be in Posidonia because they have a stand to attend. So they yes. must be in Posidonia. Yeah, yeah, we will be there. But le let's hope that uh, also some jump. Gina for sure she will be, she's a party there also. And Chris will also be because he, he's living in Greece with me. So. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, great. So we are, uh, we will be in touch. Yep. Many, many I thank, thank you all so thank you. And, and may I again apologize for my starting trouble. No, it was so no sorry. problem. It was okay. And and finally, Diwali stopped for us. I mean, we even and stopped the, Diwali. And then I, because yes. before we leave, I wanted to say something. You know, I'm hiring some people from my team um, at Varsila. And 